this list of encounters, which befell my family, dates back to the years 1990 up until early in 1995. At this time, it may be relevant to mention that in this town, all houses are leased for free to the town's inhabitants. Before our relocation into this house, early in 1990, it had been standing empty since 1983. It was less than a week later that my three-year-old sister started speaking of a woman she had seen in the living room the night before. The woman, as she had described, had blonde hair and no face. Her being young of age, the rest of the family had let the incident slip by without taking too much notice. Relevant was her persistence to this story and her fear of a built-in backyard barbecue that she desperately wanted removed. What made my mother and myself take notice that perhaps it had not been my sister's imagination after all was an event that had occurred just over a month later. At this time, my mother, my sister and myself had all been in different locations of the house when the front door had opened and we all heard my father step inside and say, hello, as he always did. What made this greeting slightly different than usual was that when we all went to greet him, he was in fact not there. What's added to the mystery was a telephone call an hour later stating that my father's car had broken down at work and my mother needed to come and collect him. This incident had been enough reason for my mother to give in and have this barbecue wrecked. Nothing out of the ordinary was found. My personal second encounter happened one evening while my sister and I had been laying on her bed. Her having just drifted off to sleep, my gaze had fallen onto the floor, where I had caught a glimpse of what looked like a sheepdog run across the floor. Sure, it was somewhat smaller, but looked genuine nonetheless. The animal had scurried across the floor and had gone into hiding beneath the bed. That was the last I had ever seen of it. That was the night before the crows began to appear. In the months that followed these events, they seemed to die down and very few including my father, would believe my mother, my sister, and my own claims that there was something wrong at 8 First Street. At this time, however, my parents started growing concerned about my growing fascination with the undead and the macabre, which made sense since I wasn't even five years old at the time. The next event that occurred I believe it was close to Christmas time, involved a beating of drums in the backyard. My sister and myself had been getting up to the normal childhood mischief when a steady beating of drums started ramming on the outside gas bottles. The drumming had been soft and slow at first, then louder, faster, until it had been loud enough for any witness to hear. This had been enough to drive both my sister and myself to tears and we had fled the house and sat crying in the street until our parents had returned from shopping or wherever it was they had gone. This incident had laid to rest any doubt that my mother may still have attained, although my father remained unconvinced what events had occurred in the years 1991 and 1992 had in the years past slipped from my memory 
with only three personal experiences remaining. The first had been, while the rest of my family had been in the backyard, and I had been alone inside. Until this day, I can still recall an unknown presence that laid its hand down on my shoulder. An icy sensation that now, over 11 years later, I can still remember as clearly as if it was happening right now. It was also around this time that my parents had discovered the artwork I had done with my top room cupboard. Three walls, two doors, all covered in drawings of the dead. It was also in this cupboard that my favourite childhood book had vanished in an instant. This meaning that I had been sitting in the dark reading it with a flashlight and the very next moment it was gone. A thorough search of both my parents proved useless and what happened to it remains a mystery up until today. The third incident I recall happened in the middle of 1992 while my sister was away at camp. This detail I recall particularly well for it just made it all the more strange that on the relevant morning wherever I had gone in the house her voice had been calling out to me. Early 1993 and all others are awoken from the silence by my father greeting incident repeating itself. Also, my father's skepticism takes a knock at this point as my mother told the story of the night before where our newly acquired Labrador retrievers both looked directly at the roof and started barking at something unseen. The loud sigh that had followed, not even my dad could deny. It was not much later that my mother started speaking of hearing a voice sitting in the hallways late at night. A voice that would die down every time she went to check on it. My sister at this time had also started growing more and more disturbed at what was happening around us and, at one point, claimed that an icy presence had been chasing her around the house and had been lifting her up whenever she tried to stop. Although this did sound far-fetched to me, the way she had looked right after, it suggested differently. What made matters worse was another incident which had supposedly occurred while my mother had been collecting me from a friend. On our homecoming, we had discovered my sister and a friend sobbing in the street, spewing claims that footsteps had been heard in the hallway, doors had been opening by themselves, and lights and radios had been switching on and off by themselves. At this time, it was now a mutual agreement. There was something seriously wrong. My own sighting of a teenage boy in the hallway, which I later lay eyes on again, just added fuel to the fire. A summons not much later that my sister had called together involving her, myself, and two of her male friends would be the last time that these forces would ever be felt. And after that, it was as if nothing had ever happened. Even the crows stopped gathering. Except one last thing. Two years had passed since the final sighting at 8 First Street, and I, age nine now, found myself sitting in the classroom. At this point, a young girl who lived only a couple of houses from me, and coincidentally had the same name as my sister, with whom I nonetheless had never truly spoken with, started telling the class about a ghost of some kind in her house. 
The stories were exactly the same as mine. It was that same week that the crows again returned. Very few at first, then later, up to twenty at a time. This happened in Gombe, Nigeria. I was about 11 when I decided I wanted to have my own personal room. I had been sharing a room with my elder brother, who is one year older than me. I lived in a three-bedroom apartment with my two siblings. My sister was having her own room. Me and my brother were sharing a single room, and our parents were having the other room also. It was a government apartment, allocated to my dad when he was transferred to the state. There was another detached two-bedroom apartment in the compound which wasn't occupied, so I decided to move there on my own. But the thing is, no one had ever lived there for the past 20 years, until the day we moved that it was renovated. I transferred all my things there and slept peacefully for about a week. The problem started when I got a stereo system and I was listening to music on a high pitch for almost every day. I started having trouble sleeping. I will sometimes wake up and couldn't go back to sleep. That's how I will stay awake until 6 a.m. It went on for like a week. And then, one day, I felt lucky as I was sleepy. So I went to bed early. I was awoken by an intense pressure I felt on my chest. And I was instantly knocked unconscious. I recovered in maybe five minutes. And I managed to see a woman sitting there before me. But she wasn't exactly facing me. She was putting on a hijab or imma. And the way she was seated seemed like she was just finished praying, facing the qibla, where Muslims face to pray. I closed and opened my eyes for like five minutes to confirm that I was not dreaming. And then, finally, my attention was drawn to a sound I heard beside me. Before I turned around, she was nowhere to be found. She just disappeared into thin air without any traces. I couldn't go back to sleep for the rest of that night. I covered myself with a blanket, despite the unfavorable condition of the weather. It's during the dry season, extremely hot. And this thought just came to me. Probably, this Jin used to observe her prayers in the house, and the music I played all day long disturbs her. That's why she decided to give me a sign. So... I decided to get rid of the stereo system the very next day, and from that day forward, I was able to sleep peacefully. I told my dad, and he told me that maybe it was the music that attracted the jinn, encouraged me to pray more, and consistently to avoid further encounter, and also get rid of anything that has to do with music at least until everything goes back to normal. This took place when I was touring Kenya, Africa, with my parents. We were in Masai Mara, one of the most famous savannas of Africa, 
we had lodged in a hotel in the savannah. The layout of the hotel was as follows. The main building was at a distance of some one kilometre from the lodging cabins. The cabins were amazing. They had a feel as if they belonged to the jungle. There was a river flowing behind the cabin but it was out of bounds as it had crocodiles in it. But we got a good view of the river from the balcony of our cabin. It was great seeing crocodiles in their own habitat. The night we reached the hotel, we were all pretty exhausted. The room was cozy, except for one weird thing. It had a deer's head hanging from one of its walls. The hotel was pretty old, so it must be placed there before hunting was banned in Africa. There was a show of Mara people that night which couldn't take place for another month. As we were there for only three days, my parents went to the show. I decided to stay back as I was very tired and the hotel was about one kilometre away. I was reading a book but must have fallen asleep. I woke up about an hour later which was quite odd as I never wake up at night once I sleep. My parents were not yet back, and as I rubbed my eyes, I swear, I saw that deer's eyes move. I was completely freaked out and closed my eyes. After some time, I passed it off as an illusion and began to read again. This was when I noticed a pretty odd thing. The curtains of the room were moving as if there was a breeze coming from the windows. But the windows were closed. Suddenly, I felt a shiver run down my spine. I felt as if I was being watched. I felt a weird cold sensation and I started praying. After a while, the feeling stopped. I kept a pendant of OM we had brought with me, and I tried to sleep. After some time, my parents returned. I didn't tell them about the experience as I assumed they would not believe me. The next day, I asked our guide, who had become a pretty good friend by then, about the experience. I thought he would know as he visited that place very frequently. He said that he didn't know anything about that, but I did feel from his tone that he was hiding something. We went on a drive in the savannas, and we came back that evening in a pretty light mood. But when we reached our cabin, we found to our astonishment that our luggage had been scattered, all messed up. We thought that the cleaner must have done it and complained to the hotel management, but they said that, as per their policy, the cleaners strictly do not touch anything belonging to a customer. The receptionist also said that the cleaning was done under supervision. We let go the incident as some misunderstanding. Then, the last and most eerie thing occurred. We were about to go to bed when we all heard someone knocking forcefully at the door. When we opened the door, there was no one. This happened two to three times. Finally fed up, we shouted to the person who was knocking to stop playing around. No answer. The knocking stopped. We gave it up as some break and retired to bed. But it must have been about 2 to 2.30 in the morning when I again heard the knocking. Sleeping on an extra bed near the door. So, I think 
I was the one who heard it. I was pretty scared to go out alone after my first experience, and we were even advised never to go out alone at night, as the area had many wild animals. So I woke my parents, and I told them about the knocking. At first, they told me that I was just getting paranoid, and that I should go to sleep. But then, we all heard the knocks on the door. My dad opened the door, only to find that there was no one there. But he saw something, something moving in the bushes. He came in and declared that it must have been some kid, though I did not feel convinced. I decided that I would rather believe that it was a kid, however. Maybe I could sleep a little easier. The next day we complained about this to the staff. They also said that it must have been some prankster. But then suddenly, my dad asked what kind of moron would have let a kid out at two in the morning. That set me thinking. I began relating this to my previous experience and felt that the place was definitely haunted. But anyways, we were to depart that day, so I didn't care that much. I didn't think about the incident until the day that we were about to leave Kenya. On the day of our departure, our guide told me that he wanted to tell me something. He asked me not to tell anyone what he was going to share with me. I agreed. He told me about that hotel. He said that, a while ago, a boy of about 9 to 10 years had broken the rule about not going out at night and had been killed by a leopard. He told me that everyone said the ghost of that boy still haunts that same room where he was staying the night he died. He said that many of his customers had the same complaints as me. But only those customers who stayed in two specific rooms had the experience. It was in room number 153 and 154. I had stayed in room number 154. seen shadow people many times, mostly while waking up from sleep paralysis with the feeling of someone being in the room. I don't want to make up stories or memories, but many times I felt that this thing that was in the room was not human and most definitely evil. It usually looked so dark without any defining features, just a darkness which was darker than the darkness of the night. Every time I would awake from a nightmare or a case of sleep paralysis, I would see that darkness in front of me. But once I get fully awake, it would disappear, so I just forgot about it until I came in front of a sight about shadow people. When I read these stories, I became dazed for days. It wasn't until later that I saw one very clearly. I was reading a book late at night when I noticed something from the corner of my eye. In those days, and I still sleep in the ground or on the floor, I just don't like sleeping in beds. When I turned around to see what it is, I remember very clearly seeing this grey ball of smoke, or what can be described as a great orb 
about the size of a football, but a little smaller. It was transparent, almost invisible. When I looked at it, it quickly ran away and hid in the darkness behind a cartoon box where I used to put my books in. It looked like it was floating and running at the same time because it was so close to the ground and it didn't make a sound. It was so clear. I thought that maybe it got startled because I saw it. I still feel them from time to time but I've never seen them as clearly as that one. The last time was about six months ago when I had sleep paralysis. When I opened up my eyes while still in that state of paralysis, I saw like a shadow moving very fast. I left the TV on that night because I felt that they were around. But just before I completely woke up, I heard very clearly a growling coming from one side of the room. The closest sound I found was the growling of hippos. There were two consecutive ones, but at a much faster pace than hippos. I could not get back to sleep, so I kept listening to the Quran the whole night before I went back to sleep. 